Right now at Unregistered Academy, we have two webinars starting that are of high interest to listeners of this podcast. Starting this week, we have a four-part interactive webinar on the Cold War, the most important series of events of the 20th century, followed by our next great book series installment, The Bible. Another four-part webinar. Go to unregisteredacademy.com and sign up now. I'll see you in class. This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. I learned pretty much everything I know about the so-called deep state from people on the left. But now, they don't want to talk about it. Except for this week's guest. This is my interview with Christian Parenti. I am joined from New York City by Christian Parenti, who has been on the show before, who has written a few, three, very recently, um, pretty remarkable articles for Compact Magazine and The Gray Zone that um, I wanted to bring to the attention of a bigger audience. So thanks for coming on to talk about this stuff, Christian. Um, Thank you for having me on the show. So you are notable as a, not just critic, but I'd say a pretty fierce critic of liberalism and I guess the left generally, but from a very left-wing perspective. Um, and we talked about that a bit the last time you were on, but you have paid attention recently to what's going on in Congress with the these new hearings that some are led by Jim Jordan and others um, investigating in particular what Jordan has called the weaponization of the FBI and other intelligence agencies against dissidents, really, political dissidents. And the political dissidents these days just happen to be in our in our society, people who are on the right, conservatives, Trump supporters, the MAGA movement, January 6th um, protesters, those people. It's no longer uh, the case that the FBI goes after the left, at least not nearly as much. Although actually in one of your articles, you do point to some very interesting recent attempts by the FBI to infiltrate, to do to do to the left what they've been doing to conservatives recently, but what they used to do to the left all the time back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So, yeah. so today or yeah. yesterday, we had this very raucous, insane, I think, hearing um, for the on the weaponization committee, of the weaponization committee, Jim Jordan's committee, in which they brought uh, Michael Schellenberger and Matt Taibbi to testify about the Twitter files and about the FBI's involvement, intervention, whatever you want to say, with Twitter in determining who gets censored and when. And um, I, I watched most of it, and I we were just talking before we started rolling here. I, the first thing is, is I was just shocked, shocked at the. Um, the intellectual quality of of the, especially the democrats i actually didn't pay attention to what the republicans said too much it was less interesting but the democrats were um they all reminded me of the assistant principals in my middle school that kind of person um someone who's very interested in holding power someone who's very insecure about their abilities and is somewhat sadistic you know so they tend to take out on their inferiors uh, using the apparatus that they're in that they're in control of um so anyway that's just my first thought but i mean there was so much else going on there what was your take on this 
I was shocked at the hostility of the Democrats towards Matt Taibbi and Michael Schellenberger. I mean, I, I, I thought that they would wear the mask of congeniality while trying to undermine the two journalists yeah. in, by way of content. But but they just came out swinging, right. and interrupting them. And I mean, they looked like the saboteurs that they are. It's very clear that the Democrats are going to u- use their power within this committee to try and discredit the committee. And that's really unfortunate because I mean, I don't think that it's only the right who are dissidents right now. I mean, and that's why I, as sure. you mentioned in the article, described this infiltration of the Black Lives Matter protests in Denver, mm-hmm. where the FBI used an informant who got at least one Black Lives Matter protester activist framed on weapons charges. And he was doing all sorts of classic Asian provocateur type things against BLM. Now, if there was a grassroots movement to pressure the Democrats to use what power they have on this committee to expand it, to look at the FBI's persecution of the left historically. And well, we don't know. Also now we we know that there's some of it now, but I mean, if that were to happen, um, that would have been a good thing. But it's very clear as of this, the, the second hearing they've had that the Democrats are not going to do that. And they are trying to sabotage this committee and turn it into you know a circus and that was i just the blatant quality of that shocked me right yeah me too i was surprised i didn't think they'd have such outright hostility toward these guys um it's it just shows how tribalistic and partisan they are i think um i'm sure they were fans formerly of matt taibbi at least you know when he was writing for rolling stone i'm sure they thought he was a, a very upstanding journalist, but they called them so-called journalists, which yeah. was amazing. I mean, Taibbi used to write for Rolling Stone. He's won, he's won journalism right. awards. Oh, yeah, it was outrageous. It was totally outrageous. I also thought they they overplayed their hand that yeah. Matt Taibbi is, is too well known and too well respected for that to work. They, they, the Democrats, appeared to be what they are, which is dishonest, undermining, partisan saboteurs. You know, um, you know, it's outrageous. And so they, here they are, like, let's just zoom out for a second. Here they are defending a totally out of control set of agencies, right? I mean, there's a m- number of ways you can look at what the FBI and these other domestic security agencies do. And there's a long history, as I lay out in the article, of the FBI in particular attacking the left. Mm-hmm. And you can say, okay, the FBI is about reproducing the social relations of capitalism. You, you could, you know, assemble lots of information that proves that. But the FBI also goes after apolitical people, and it has mm-hmm. occasionally throughout its history gone after the right. So to argue though, the FBI never goes after the right because the FBI is populated by people with right wing politics. That's not true. The FBI goes, it has a history of going after the right, not very often, not as aggressively as it goes after the left, doing so only when pressured by politicians, doing so only in reaction to real genuine right wing violence. But it's not like the FBI doesn't have a history of also going after the right. And it has, in fact, used its incursions against the right to build capacity and autonomy and secrecy that have then facilitated its wars against the left. So, you know, you could say, oh, the FBI is about containing and controlling the left. That's true. But it's also the FBI clearly has a record of occasionally attacking the right, and it has a record of attacking apolitical people. Mm -hmm. We are at the end, hopefully, of a really almost a 15 year long, multi-billion dollar campaign against American Muslims. Mm. And following 9-11. Most Mm. of these people who were targeted were apolitical, Mm. right? And it was the FBI was using the the justification of the war on terror and and the the outrage of 9-11 to conduct a campaign of of self-aggrandizement. The key fact is that the vast majority of the cases, of the anti-jihadist cases that the FBI comes, you know, produces in that time are based on the roles of paid informants and they constitute entrapment. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, no one except the FBI maintains that, that the, that a majority of these cases weren't entrapment. There were no crimes in most of these cases, there were no crimes that were going to happen. And that the, the conspiracies that people were convicted on were by and large generated by paid FBI informants. 
And the number of informants has ballooned from in the days of the church committee in yes. the late seventies. Uh, they found that there were fifteen hundred paid informants. We now know from various FBI pay records that have come up in discovery in various legal cases mm -hmm. that there are at least fifteen thousand paid informants. There are reasons to believe whistleblowers' testimony here and there that that there could be up to you know three times as many informal off the books paid in cash informants as well so there's a, a huge army of of informants and during the the war on terror there were lots of articles in often very mainstream publications detailing how these informants you know they they, they become very entrepreneurial you know hmm. they have to find work for themselves the hmm. fbi agents who are managing them they're looking to rise through the ranks so there are all these you know classically Weberian bureaucratic interests at play. People are trying to get ahead, make a buck, rise to the ranks. And so they'll go after anyone, you know? And they also, the FBI, has a record of going after mainstream politicians. J. Edgar Hoover built the bureau in part by having dirt on people, compromise on, yep. on the political class. Mm -hmm. So very few politicians want to go up against him. It's a, mm -hmm. you know, the record of going up against the FBI isn't particularly good so you know why do that you can see oh, I'm, I'm here to help my constituency get better roads and a few more jobs do i really want to die on the hill of confronting the fbi yes the critics are right but come on you know so yeah, yeah. as chuck schumer said uh, a few years ago the fbi and this the intelligence agencies have six ways from sunday to get back at you yeah and he was he was referring to donald trump basically predicting what was going to happen to trump which it did yep. Which, you know, there's a there's a really big sort of theoretical question here that, you know, about sort of the autonomy of the state, um, right? And, you know, the autonomy of the bureaucracy within the state, the so-called deep state. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but growing up as a standard lefty, I never bought that. I never thought, now it seems obvious to me that there's definitely a deep state. But, you know, for most of my life, I just didn't, it didn't make sense to me. I mean, I thought of sort of the political class as, you know, the managerial wing of the ruling class, the capitalist ruling class. And I also thought that that the president really does run the show, you know, and they just happen to select people who are ideologically aligned with the American empire and liberal capitalism. And that's so there was never any conflict there until Trump, you know, but now it just seems indisputable that there is although I'm curious what you have to say about this, but that there is, I guess it's a bureaucracy that that moves past the elections that remains basically a permanent class within Washington, D.C., that, of course, has its own interests and its own ideologies. And turns out, makes sense, that most of the civil servants who work, who are in the so-called deep state, you know, or who work for the federal government are, of course, liberal, Democrats, et cetera. And so they're going to do what they can to protect the power of the Democratic Party. What do you think about this, though? I mean, is this is this plausible well, to you? Yeah, but I also, you, you know, you got to remember, these are paramilitary organizations that receive orders from on high. Mm. And what matters more than the, the culture of the organization as a whole is that the thinking of the leadership. And so I think it's pretty clear in this segue to the article Trump against empire. I mean, I think it's pretty clear that uh, the the political class and the permanent bureaucratic class, the top echelons of it in D.C., by and large, hate Donald Trump and fear him. And I think the reasons they do that are right. because of what Trump did around American empire, about American foreign policy, American hegemony. So I think that's what matters most. And, and the actual positions of mid-level FBI agents, I think, is, is less important because you know, it's it's not a food co-op or something like that where it's like, well, what do you guys think? Who do you think we should go after? It's like that's that comes down. It's like this is what you're doing now. If you don't like it, you know, you can go find a job in the private sector. So you mean uh, you mean the leadership? But in, terms of, but in terms of the interests of these agencies, absolutely. Yes. I mean the FBI, so the FBI has no charter, right? It's just a bureau, it's a desk within the Justice Department. Hoover builds it. So Empire Building has always been central. The FBI serves the interests of the ruling class, but it also serves the FBI's interests. The FBI is also about the FBI. It's about expanding FBI budgets and secrecy, latitude, power, autonomy, et cetera. 
Mm -hmm. So I think that that's that that's very real. That there are these there are these bureaucracies, and I didn't in the article actually use the term deep state. The editors put that as the headline. I don't have a problem with the term deep state, but I don't use it generally because it triggers leftists and liberals, and uh, they then just shut down and they and they, they want to get semantic and, and argue about like what this thing means. So you know, I actually generally try and avoid it and speak in more precise terms uh, in terms of a, a set of bureaucracies and the interests of those bureaucracies. And the, you see this in characters like Anthony Fauci. And he's perhaps the, the best example. He was the highest paid worker in the federal government. And he, similarly to J. Edgar Hoover, right, he built a, a, a unit within the NIH, the, yeah. the NIAID, uh, into a, a real powerhouse to the point where he controls a large part of the research funding related to infectious diseases in the world. So, mm -hmm. and, and thereby controls indirectly a huge group of scientists and institutions that learn what the boundaries are. They learn that if you propose a project that strays away from what Anthony Fauci likes, you're not probably not going to get funding. But if you, you know, listen closely and do what he does like, you're going to get a lot of funding. So, yeah, I mean, he's, you know, he's an example of that. And, and certainly uh, the FBI and security state, these, these institutions, they have, they have interests that are about the reproduction of the bureaucracy. Okay. I guess I was going to ask you that. So the leaders of these agencies who might constitute the deep state, their motivations are simply um, for the agencies they represent themselves and nothing else. Or is there something ideological? I think there's also an ideological thing, okay. which is, that, you know, like, let's look at the article Trump against empire. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, if yeah. you are a DC elite, chances are you believe that the United States is an indispensable, vital force in the world system. And so anyone who attacks it, you're going to, for ideological reasons, think that they are a danger to good things, including your own self-interest as an increasingly wealthy American connected to this whole apparatus. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think there is there's, you know, ideology plays into it as well as class interest, as well as bureaucratic interest. You know, are you going to build your your network, your your bureau, or not? Of course, you know, we all do it. I mean, I mean, every every university department. There's no university department that's ever going to be like, you know, I think we have enough anthropologists. You know, they're going to be like, no, no, we need more anthropologists. You know, right? Whether or not we do. Yeah, um, I love your article on Trump and the deep state, and I have. I agree with it wholeheartedly, and it's an argument I've been making since the get-go, um, that those in Washington, D.C. who have sought to undermine Trump at every turn were principally motivated by um, their their need, really, to defend the American, what we call the American empire. Um, Trump's various, sometimes ham-fisted attacks on NATO and regime change operations and all that, you know, is what I think sent them into a panic and made them do all sorts of things, and including, you know, majorly uh, fudging elections, uh, <laughs> to put yeah. it politely, right? So, yeah. um, the I would say that is because commitment to a global American empire is part of the American political religion. Every president, damn near every senator, and certainly the vast majority of Congress people who have ever existed since the founding have been committed to this. They have all known in their hearts that the United States of America should be the leader of the world. Mm -hmm. And this goes back to John Adams and Thomas Jefferson and all of them. Um, every, every political leader I'm aware of, with like just a tiny number of exceptions, have been fully religiously committed to that vision of expanding and maintaining the American global empire. And so these these people who work in the federal government now and have for presumably, you know, many, many years, sometimes generations, sometimes multiple generations, they too are part of that religion. Now, the thing about that religion of American imperialism, it doesn't really tend to uh, 
to be diffused among the people, right? Most Americans don't have that, really don't give a shit what the Americans do, what the United States does in foreign policy. They're unaware of it generally. But people in government, especially those with national ambitions, have, you know, uniformly been committed to that. So is that, does that make sense that, that that's what yeah, it makes is sense. Yeah. Okay. It, is, it is definitely one of the third rails. You see it clearly and unfortunately with uh, people like Bernie Sanders. Yeah. A, a certain level of socialist politics can be tolerated. It's right. not enjoyed. That's right. Appreciated. But what can't be tolerated is really going after the American empire. And so it, it almost seems like that's the price of the price of participation for socialists. And we've now seen that with the squad or most mm -hmm. of them voting for war credits for Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a, it's a big problem. And, and you know, what happened with Trump when he's elected him, mean, he runs on, I'm going to end these forever wars. And, you know, at first, like, whatever, Donald Trump, one, he's not going to get elected Two, he's a fraud and charlatan. So whatever, they're going to take his phone away from him. He's not going to tweet and they're going to tell him what to do when he gets there. But that's not what happened. They did not take his phone away. He did not stop tweeting. And he refused to understand how the American empire worked. And they were trying to contain him. One of my favorite vignettes in the article is when six months into his administration, the Joint Chiefs of Staff invite Trump to the Pentagon and they have a meeting in a famously secure meeting room called the tank. And they try to explain to him what the American informal empire is, how it works, how the trade deals interact with the diplomatic relations, with the military deployments, with the surveillance and intelligence apparatus, and it's all over his head. And he gets pissed off and he says to them, you know, he says, you know, uh, in the Middle East, we've spent seven, first he says, you guys are dopes mm -hmm. and losers and babies. In the Middle East, we've spent seven generals. trillion dollars. Talking to generals. Yeah. You said talk to some of the most powerful men in the world. You right. You, you, we've spent seven trillion dollars. Uh, you know, we're suckers. Where's the fucking oil? Right. <laughs> and then, I mean, can you imagine being one of the joint chiefs? And you're like, whoa, this this guy is like not getting it, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think there were two things that informed Trump's contradictory and haphazard vandalism of American global hegemony. One is his sort of crass transactional sensibility. Mm -hmm. He was later in his administration demanding cost plus 50% from people. <laughs> so he treated the American empire as if it was a poorly run security business. Co and cost plus, other, you wanted that from allies, right? You wanted, wanted that from allies. You got allied US nations to pay that. Area. Yeah, you pay, you, pay, you pay the cost plus 50%. <laughs> you know, this is a security business. We got to be making money on it. That's you know right. what? I'm going to interrupt myself and, and lock my dog in the other room. Here, you're being a little bit like about that. She was all good. Okay, so um, yeah, so he had this crass transactional view of things, mm -hmm. and uh, in and and that was rooted in the fact that he did not understand how American capitalism is subsidized by. The American public sector, not only domestically through bailouts, et cetera, but internationally through this endless expenditure on hard and soft and intelligence power. He just didn't get that. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I didn't really illustrate or highlight in the article, but I think is important, is that his base is not into this stuff. So you were saying earlier that most people don't understand. It's true, most people don't understand, but a lot of people have some sense of what's going on, which is that we spend a lot of money internationally mm -hmm. and that we have destroyed states that didn't really threaten us. And, you know, that people go off to these wars and they never seem to stop and they come back often wounded or disturbed by their experiences. And no nothing, nothing seems to be produced by all this, while meanwhile at home, there's ever more disinvestment and ever more suffering. And there doesn't seem to be commensurate action from the public sector at home. And so when Trump said, I'm going to end the forever wars, that resonated with people. And when he took steps to do that, they liked that. And he's a very intuitive politician. He might not be that smart. You know, he's like basically like a jazz musician who can't read music but knows how to blow the horn you know yep. what i mean mm -hmm. like so he can tell what works and i think that was another part of it is that, that uh 
you don't have to understand American empire in much detail to not like it. You know, you just like, <laughs> True. What, what is this all about? Where, what's in it for me? You know, unless you're Victoria Newland or Samantha Power or somebody who's right. like deeply ideological about it. Right. right. Which is just and a tiny also, handful of people. And who's also, you know, making money and becoming famous because of it. And also, you know, most journalists and, you know, um, NGO works. Yeah, there's a whole, there's a small, but, but, you know, significant class of people who work in the international sectors who, who are real, generally true believers and, and benefit directly or indirectly from this whole project. Yeah. You know, even if it's very indirectly, you know, if you're going to be a, a war correspondent and go gallivanting around the world, um, you know, you're kind of, often you're going to be working with the U.S. government. They're going to be you know, needing their protection, you or whatever. It's like, or you just get habituated into the the normal, the idea that it is normal for the U.S. to go around violating the sovereignty of this state and that state, and it's okay for us to do it because we have noble ambitions and ideas, and and even though we have this long record of it all going wrong and oops, uh, you know, misrepresenting our enemies, that well, those are all just isolated incidents that don't bear on the the fundamental truth, which is that we're a good country and we're doing the right thing. And even though it's bad that other people intervene, if other states intervene in their neighbor's business, that's bad. But when we do it, it's cool, right? And that, you know, most of the most of the foreign correspondent class and diplomatic class believes that. Right. The this meeting that Trump had in the tank with the Joint Chiefs is one of the greatest moments in presidential history, in my view. And I <laughs> wish to I wish to I wish to God there was a camera in the room. I would what would you pay to watch that, you know, that video? I'd yeah. love to see like it's fodder for like a Hollywood movie. Not that they would ever do this, but it would be an amazing movie to see that, right? But yeah. it also when you were talking, when you said that he just doesn't get it, and part of what you said was he doesn't get how the empire helps business, American business. Yeah. I want to think through this a little bit. I think it's maybe more nuanced than that. So there are certain businesses and industries that, of course, benefit from the American empire, from militarism. Defense contractors is the most obvious. But I would say that in general, and I've actually done the history on this and looked at this, um, for all the wars of America, it's going back to the Spanish-American War, big businesses have generally opposed the wars until the very last moment when they've been sort of dragged into it, except for defense contractors, of course, because in general, it's not good for business. War is not good for business, right? It disrupts well, yeah. all the trade and it, it is very disruptive of commerce. And so yeah, most, but that, yeah. But that doesn't show that it's not good for American capitalism because okay. access to markets, access to raw materials is is proof the utility of that access is proven not by what the corporate CEO class thinks. Gotcha. They are notoriously dumb. I, I actually just um, reread C. Wright Mills's Power Elite, and he's very good mm. on. You know, it was sort of surprising just how dumb the CEOs were even back mm. then. You know, they were like didn't read, thought people who read books were kind of weird. Mm. Um, but the you know the some the effect of American Empire is that the world is more open and accessible to American corporations and yes. uh, American investment. Yes, that is true. Now, the thing is, that was- And, and we, I mean, it's, it also gets into a, a little bit about arguing counterfactually, which is difficult, but what would the world be like if there hadn't been a coup against Jacobo Arbenz in Guatemala in 1953 when he did land reform? What would mm -hmm. the world be like if, there, if, if you just eliminated mm -hmm. all the coups against the- you know, moderate nationalists who wanted to redistribute a little bit of money and have a mixed economy and try and develop their companies. What would the world look like? What would what kind of taxes would American corporations have to pay to do business on the scale they currently do? We don't know. We can only guess. Would would United Fruit still be in Guatemala, right? And as powerful as it is, right? Exactly. Right. Um, well, I that's I agree with all of that. Now the thing is though, I think opening up the world to resources, to cheap labor also, you didn't mention that, and and markets, which is what the empire certainly has often been about. I think that has that paid dividends, obviously, for the, for the aggregate American economy until recently, though. And maybe that's what Trump is responding to, is that it's not so much, it's not a great deal anymore for just Americans in general because of the trillions of dollars that we've spent, the trillions in debt because of it. And as he said, where's the fucking oil? We spent all this money, speaking like a businessman, 
and we didn't get any oil out of it. In fact, oil is now more expensive, right? In 2023, after all this intervention. Um, so um, could that be? He just It was a straight businessman's approach to this and that, that the American empire is not paying off anymore for American business, for the capitalist class? I wonder. Well, no, I think it is because it's, you know, um, the low tax regimes, the the low regulations everywhere. And when firms, American firms benefit from that, it's still it's still paying off. Uh, I, I mean, I don't I don't think there's been some radical transformation in the, the cost benefits of American empire. I, I'm, you know, it's a whole other question, but I, I don't think the average American has benefited tremendously from American empire. You know, again, it's counterfactuals. So mm -hmm. what would what would the standard of living for the average American worker have been in 1965 if we didn't have this informal empire or if we had an informal empire, but it was smaller and it didn't overthrow as many governments? I mean, who knows? Um, but I think you could make a strong case that it wouldn't have mattered that much that the average person's standard of living was primarily based on the value that they produced manufacturing things here in the US. And while there might have been, you know, higher input costs or maybe fewer or less export markets, mm -hmm. you know, maybe who knows. Particular American corporations like United Fruit or ITT most certainly benefited, obviously, from military interventions, right? Uh, but overall, the economy as a whole, maybe not. Yeah, I mean, I think you could you could make a case. This this is now we're in the realm of you know wild speculation, counterfactual. But I mean, you could make the case that the reason the U.S. deindustrializes is because of the kind of arrogance that comes along with this level of military power. That that's why the U.S. could be like, well, we're gonna we're just gonna export you know a large part of our industrial base overseas, including to China, mm -hmm. because we get to do whatever we want. Because we're the United States of America and nobody fucks with us, right? Mm -hmm. Because we can destroy anyone. Like that sensibility means that you lose track of, wait a minute, there are all sorts of consequences if you allow the deindustrialization of your economy. You're going to have a very different kind of politics. You're going to have a very different kind of standard of living. We're now learning in, you know, only the last two decades really that innovation itself breaks down turns out it's not enough to have a bunch of smart engineers in silicon valley while the production's all happening in china that if you separate the engineers from the frontline manufacturing insights break down in ways we're not even really mm. clear about but there's mm. something about the the ecology of manufacturing that gets disrupted by globalization mm -hmm. so i think there's a strong case to be made that that the average person in the United States is far worse off because of American empire, because American empire has made American elites arrogant enough to think that they can hollow out their own economy and not pay any sort of price for it. Brilliant. Nicely. Well put. I like that a lot. Um, let's let's talk about Trump specifically and in, in the empire here, because that's the subject of your article, one of your articles. And so I have made, as I said, I've made the same argument before. Um, I don't know if you know Ben Burgess, but he's a friend of mine. He's been on the show many times, and he he jumps down my throat whenever I talk about Trump being anti-war at all. And he'll he'll and he's he's right to a point. I mean, he says you know Trump sent javelin missiles to Ukraine long before that was sexy. You know, way before anyone was talking about Ukraine, he was the first to do it. He put sanctions on Nord Stream long before Biden made any threats against it. He worst of all continued the grotesque war in Yemen right? Allowed, even ramped it up a bit with the Saudis. And he killed Soleimani, you know, um, further antagonizing Iran and backed out of the nuclear deal with Iran. So that's pretty bad yeah. from our, from our perspective on the anti-war side, that's pretty bad stuff. However, he did a lot of other stuff. Yeah. He, you know, I don't think he, what I argue in the piece is that his anti, I, what I call it vandalism, because I like the, yeah. his, Implication was something sort of random about that. Yeah. His vandalism of American empire was not consistent and not particularly coherent. He increased sanctions on Cuba, but he normalized, almost normalized relations with North Korea. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he increased the military budget, yet he withdrew troops from you know, places all over the world, right? So mm -hmm. it was it was chaotic. The, the important thing is that it was destructive of this delicate system 
you know, it's an informal empire. It's not a formal empire. It requires lots and lots of consent from allies. And the relationship to allies is that they help us project power globally, but also their consent allows a kind of control over them, as we're seeing in this Ukraine war with the Europeans, who are only now waking up to the fact that, wait a minute, are we being deindustrialized by the United States, right. which has allowed our energy prices to soar, not as much as we thought they would, while offering all of these green subsidies over there, and we're seeing like, you know, European firms go to the US. But so I think that to to debate is Donald Trump anti-war or not it is to some extent to miss the point. What Donald Trump did as president was objectively damaging to the American empire. So he withdrew troops from Somalia. Mm -hmm. Look at a map. It's a very strategic, important place, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. He withdrew troops from Syria, leftists will folks, well, they were redeployed and they went to the oil. Syria has very little oil. None of it is exported. There, some troops were moved over. It was very humiliating. U.S. troops pulled out of bases that Russians and Syrian forces then occupied. He withdrew troops from with about a quarter of the troops from Afghanistan, uh, about a third of the troops from Iraq. He he negotiated, or his administration, uh, Khalizad, Hamid Khalizad, uh, negotiated the, the, the peace treaty that ended the Afghan war. And people mm -hmm. want to dismiss that because there was a bit of a debacle at the end, but they forget that, wait a minute, if, if there had not been a treaty with the Taliban, that US withdrawal would have been a, a bloody fighting chaotic retreat all the way. As it was, it was you know, a horrible spectacle, but uh, it, that whole thing was predicated on Trump's negotiation of that war. He reduced a third of the, he ordered a, 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 the return of a third of the American personnel in Germany. His Defense Secretary Mark Espers basically sabotaged him. All of these people were sabotaging him from inside. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Espers redeployed most of them within Europe and managed to spin it as part of the traditional agenda of threatening Russia. But what Trump had wanted was that a third of the U.S. troops in Germany come home. There are 40 installations that host American forces in Germany. There is up to 150 atomic weapons there. Uh, AFRICOM's headquarters are there. It, it, this is a a hugely important component in American empire. It should be noted, I didn't say this in the article, but in military science, generally, if you reduce, in combat, if a force is reduced by one third due to casualties, killed and wounded, it, it tends to lose its combat effectiveness. Mm -hmm. Trump, in one, swell, one swift move, wanted a third of the, the deployment to Germany removed. And these are not soldiers sitting in, trenches looking out you know for the russians these are people involved in very high tech and delicately interconnected systems so it's very hard to remove a third of them and not do more than a third's worth of damage to the whole thing similarly in south korea it's it's not just a bunch of marines at the dmv it's 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 a high tech infrastructure and it's hard to remove 25 percent of those personnel and not really mess up the architecture of how the power is projected etc so yes he did those things i mean nord stream his stuff on nord stream that fit with his transactional sensibility he's like wait a minute the russians get to sell the europeans oil uh, uh gas we've got the fracking revolution we should be selling them gas so that's why he hated nord stream and and that i think is an important point for those who really think that Trump was a Russian agent, because, I mean, if he was a Russian agent, he would have not gone after Nord Stream. He really hated Nord Stream and he hated NATO. He wanted to remove the U.S. from NATO, which you get. Is that true? Like, I, yeah. I haven't actually seen that. When did he say that? He. Um, he made it's in, it's in Mark Esper's biography. OK, I mean, he would talk about it. Wow. He wanted to he, he wanted to close all U.S. embassies in Africa, all of them. Like, why do we have, let's close them, right? So, <laughs> Shithole countries. Why would you want an embassy yeah, there? Right. That's, yeah. So, the, and part, part, of, part of researching this, I, I you know, I had um, a certain kind of um, sympathy slash schadenfreude for, you know, the military power elite. Uh, just imagining what it was like for them mm -hmm. to do this guy and how threatening 
-hmm. It must have been, and it, it made it gave me insight. I, I can see how they how they convinced themselves he really is a Russian Russian agent, even though there's no evidence, right? And the evidence is like in the minds of these characters, it's like he visited the Soviet Union in 1987. <laughs> you, know, but, you know, everybody was visiting the so you know I, I visited the Soviet Union. Yeah, you did. I was there in 1987. You were? Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah I was there in 1986 or five. You know, that's funny. You, you think? <laughs> Yeah, and he wanted to open a hotel there, you know, and um, right. but you could I, I, I can I had a certain sympathy for how they allowed themselves to go so insane. And it's because if you looked at what he was doing to the American Empire, it, it was significant. It was meaningful. I got to say, yeah, I didn't know this until I read your article about him going after the bases in Germany and South Korea. I mean, those are the hub of the global American Empire. I mean, so many things. I mean, every time you see some news story about Ukraine, you see the Ramstein Air Base mentioned in it because everything kind of goes through there, goes through the American installations in Germany. Yeah. And in the Pacific, everything goes through either Okinawa or mostly South Korea. That's where most of the troops are. It's the largest military, U.S. military installation in the world. So if you go yeah. after those two, there's nowhere, it's very difficult to wage any operations outside the borders, right? Because they need those advanced what are they called forward positions or whatever to to launch from yeah i mean the afghanistan war was fought from ramstein you know yeah. the iraq war largely was fought from ramstein um iraq and, wounded uh, american soldiers who were wounded in iraq would immediately be taken to a combat support hospital but then as soon as possible to baghdad international airport and then out to to uh langstall medical facility in in near the the big ramstein base air base in germany Right. Yeah. And then what's going on now is the now that they're hawkish on China, I mean, where do you think they're planning on attacking China from? It's the bases in predominantly South Korea and Japan, but, you know, that whole area. And um, they're they can't do it if they if you withdraw significant numbers of troops from those places. Yeah. Trump also he, he withdrew from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Yeah, that was a huge deal. Yeah. You know, I mean, that was really the the kind of crown jewel of the Obama administration's pivot to Asia. He just pulled the plug on that. He pulled out of all sorts of other treaties, uh, you know, didn't want to pay the WHO because he thought they were soft on China, which they were vis-a-vis -vis the pandemic. Um, so there's I mean, there's all of that component, the softer aspect of American informal empire that he was also wreaking havoc on. OK, so now you and I think I mean like ahead, if you yeah. were to close if someone were to close all of the embassies in Africa let's just be clear the CIA operates out of all sorts of places but there's always a CIA presence in the embassies it's mm -hmm. generally central to the CIA's operations in a foreign country if you were to close all those embassies you would hobble the CIA's operations mm -hmm. in the entire continent of Africa in a very very serious way yeah it's big now you and I see all this as vandalism but worse than, a little worse there's some structural damage going on here also right to the american yeah. empire the question though um is whether the people in the government thought this too right whether they were actually threatened by this i mean i believe they were but i want to see some evidence um whether they actually this is what motivated them to go on an anti-trump rampage or was it that he was a racist white supremacist who grabbed women by the pussies which is what they usually say you know overwhelmingly what we have heard for the last six years is that the reason trump is bad and must go is all the cultural stuff basically yeah. right um what do you i mean what do you say to that i, I think i i think that that uh didn't matter as much that that that's the kind of stuff that is genuinely offensive to many people but that they will overlook it if other more important things like Mm -hmm. stewarding the american empire are taken care of but that you know once he is vandalizing the american empire then you know your average uh never trump republican or democrat really really finds their really like serious conviction about this uh hollywood access tape mm -hmm. you know whereas before they might have been like well you know if he was doing the right thing then whatever bill clinton strayed you know people are people whatever jfk was a Maybe the Lander, but you know, good president, that kind of thing. Now, I think this is, I think you can say this, I think this is just established that the anti-Trump movement from the beginning was led, led by the intelligence agencies and the FBI, right? I mean, 
all the information that was handed over to the New York Times, that was leaked to the New York Times, that, that was the fodder, was the- I, guess, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, there's also, you could say the Democratic Party plays a pretty big role well, in, sure. you know- No, but um, in, terms, in terms of leaking information to the, to the media, which was the source of all the anti-Trump stuff, right? That was all these unnamed sources and New York Times articles about Trump did this, Trump did that. That mm -hmm. overwhelmingly came, I think, from intelligence folk. Yeah, I think, so. I think that's probably right. And then, um, you know, the signing off on the the idea that uh, the the Hunter Biden laptop story was a hack and dump and was fake news. I mean, you know, we have the 50 intelligence uh, professionals signing that signing off on that. But yeah, I mean, what we, we see most clearly the, uh, the, 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 you know, the domestic intelligence state intervening in our politics around the, the more recent election, right? Trump's reelection or right. his attempt to get reelected. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, in that it's very serious. And this also relates to another, there's another critique of American empire, right? This is one of the oldest critiques of empire said you cannot have an empire abroad and a republic at home without all of that stuff coming back to infect the politics of the republic and to undermine democracy right mm -hmm. i mean rome begins as a monarchy becomes a republic ends as an empire right mm -hmm. it's it's very hard for for that not to happen there are examples you know the uk gives up its empire after, exhausted after two world wars and all that and manages mm -hmm. to have a very quite democratic and even social democratic good long run from the end of World War II to to Thatcher, but that that's a real that's a real threat. So, and we see that coming to bear in the case of the Hunter Biden laptop. Mm. And what happens? I'm sure your listeners probably know this, but I've been shocked by the number of people who, who aren't aware of this. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Hunter Biden does leave his laptop at a Delaware repair shop he abandons it he's he signs the document saying that you know i forfeit ownership if i don't come and get it you know six weeks after being requested to do so the guy tries to get in touch with hunter biden he can't and he opens up the laptop snooping around or maybe he's going to refurbish it whatever it's his laptop now legally and he discovers well this is uh this is Hunter Biden, the son of the president's laptop. And there's a lot of incriminating evidence here. Never mind the crack cocaine, never mind the prostitutes. That's not mm -hmm. that's not important. There is evidence of influence peddling. Right. Of, of you know, Hunter Biden using his influence as the president's son, vice president, and then president's son to, to make lots of money. And well, the Mac owner gets scared. He, his father brings a copy of the contents to the FBI in Arizona, where the father lives, I guess. The FBI don't want it. Uh, the, he then he gives a copy at some point to Giuliani and Giuliani's lawyers. The FBI show up and get the laptop from the, the Mac shop in December of 2019. And they tell him at that point that generally people who keep their mouths shut about this sort of stuff don't have any problems which is scary mm. for him to hear. <laughs> and they then, the FBI then starts this influence campaign. How extensive it is, we don't know. Um, how coordinated it is, we don't know. But there's, the FBI starts telling social media and traditional media that we are expecting a Russian hack and dump operation that will involve Hunter Biden, and you need to be aware of this, meaning you need to not, they don't quite say you are under orders from the federal government in violation of the First Amendment, not to publish this. They don't say that, but they're like, you understand? You understand what, we, what we'd like you to do? You know, how dumb are you? Oh, good. You're smart. All right. Great. Um, that kind of thing. And so then the story is suppressed. The Post, the New York Post runs with it. Giuliani gives the information to Miranda Devine. She runs this story it's the october surprise it's the gop's october surprise they're like mm -hmm. boom we got this guy dead to rights his son is influence peddling and in there there is very suspicious stuff like hunter biden it, on one deal says explains how the income stream to um the i forget whether it's rosemont capital or or seneca it's one of one of his companies um 
they're all named for places in the, the Finger Lakes area hmm. uh, where they had a uh, vacation home. You know, he lays out who gets what, and there's one line which says, and 10% for the big guy to be paid to Hunter Biden. Elsewhere in the laptop, uh, uh, Joe Biden is referred to as the big guy. You know, uh, Tony Bobolinsky, who now has turned, you know, against the the, the Bidens and is, you know, testifying openly is around this, says that that the big guy referred to Biden. So there's very serious circumstantial evidence that Biden might have himself been making money off of this. Right. Um, when, what Hunter Biden does around Bermissa is, you know, Bermissa is the largest natural gas company in Ukraine. They're being investigated by a prosecutor in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Now, Ukraine is one of the most corrupt countries in the world. So my guess would be that both Bermissa and the prosecutor investigating were, were corrupt. Mm -hmm. They hire, Bermissa hires Hunter Biden for just shy of a million dollars a year to make this investigation go away. Mm -hmm. Hunter Biden, it would seem, achieves that because Joe Biden visits Kiev and tells the government, you got to get rid of this prosecutor. We know Joe Biden did that because he then goes and he brags about it on video. And his claim is, well, this guy was corrupt and we're fighting corruption. Yep. Well, I'm sure, you know, I'm guessing, but he probably was corrupt, right? There's a right. lot of corruption in Ukraine. But I don't think that was what was most important. I think more important was that his son was making a million dollars a year to get that investigation terminated. Right. right. He, he did it. Yeah. So, yeah. so the FBI <clears throat> puts its thumb on the scale of the election by getting the media to ignore and or the social media to then kill and censor the story when it is finally broken by the New York Post. And right. I am, you know, I'm saying this not because I wished Donald Trump had been reelected. Uh, you know, I voted for Biden, actually. And I, you know, some of his policies I've been pleasantly surprised with. But I am not OK with the domestic intelligence agencies intervening in elections that has got to be a red line for anyone who takes democracy seriously and people need to take democracy seriously i covid really brought out the classical liberal in me hmm. i mean i i have always defended democracy and civil liberties all of my books have dealt with that to some extent hmm. but i think like many leftists i had perhaps more of an instrumentalist relationship to these freedoms, mm -hmm. um, you know, civil liberties are good because you can do stuff with them. You can yeah, right. agitate for progressive social change. And right. that's all true. And I still appreciate them for those instrumentalist reasons. Mm -hmm. But I also appreciate them because of what they are. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we may or may not get some sort of just political economic order somewhere down the line. But in the meantime, these freedoms of, you know, being able to read what you want, see the truth, say what you want, you know, go where you want. This stuff is an ends in itself, as mm -hmm. well as being mm -hmm. useful for the possibilities of creating progressive social change. They are also very important. I don't want to live in a society dominated by censorship. And, you know, we saw massive censorship around COVID, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Jay Bhattacharya, mm -hmm. Martin Kilborg, these are top flight virologists, epidemiologists, and they were treated like total freaks and, mm -hmm. and they had their work censored effectively, you know, right. uh, the volume, whatever that, the, you know, it was the visibility was turned down, but sometimes worse than that, I believe. I don't know all the details about how much of that stuff, you know, their accounts were, right. how much they were messed with, but we know that they were messed with. And now we're realizing, oh, you know, these are the, these are the people who recommended focused protection and rather than society-wide lockdown. And we're now seeing this surge in all-cause mortality that is not, it's not just hidden COVID, right? Even if you're like, okay, maybe some of this surge in all-cause mortality, maybe it is the lingering effect, not long COVID, but maybe it's the lingering damaging effects of COVID, some of that. But a lot of it is clearly also the role, uh, the result of lockdowns, mm -hmm. right? And in retrospect, we're like, oh, focused protection. These guys were right, you know? Right. And a lot of people died because- right they were mocked and censored. Correct. And yeah, I mean, and the left is just, oof, man, the left totally failed that stress test. And I, I, I'm still, I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to get my head around that. 
And I'm, I've been shocked to see how people on the left, my friends, my, you know, long time smart lefty friends, a lot of them are saying, oh, the, the Twitter files don't matter. We knew this already. It's like, well, wait a minute. We didn't know all these details. No. <laughs> and if, if it does confirm what you suspected all along, why aren't you interested in the details? Right. And I've, I've even heard, uh, I had a friend who was saying, oh, I don't think it's a violation of the First Amendment. It's like, how could it not be a violation of the First Amendment? He said, well, this guy's a lawyer uh, whose partner works for the ACLU. He said, well, because you're not entirely removed from the public square. It's just this one little outlet. You know, I mean, the First Amendment says, it does not say the government shall not entirely limit your access <laughs> to the public square. It says the right. government shall not abridge mm -hmm. speech or the press. I mean, abridge, it means mm -hmm. damage a little bit, limit a little bit, right? It, it's mm -hmm. clearly a violation of the First Amendment, or it seems to me, but so. Uh, um, yeah. Um, so yeah, you hang out with a lot of lefties. I hang out with a lot of lefties, always have. I know a lot of them. And when I bring these things up, they, it's not even a matter of them sort of trying to deflect or coming up with counter arguments. They literally have never heard of this stuff. Yeah. A they, lot, just, a lot of that. they don't know basic facts. I mean, they yeah. don't know about ivermectin. They don't know who Jay Bhattacharya is. They don't know what Burisma is. They don't, you know, they don't know. They don't know that there is a surge in all cause mortality. They don't know that the UK no longer gives out the shots to anyone under age 50. That happened February 12th this year. They don't know that right. Denmark and most of the other Nordic states are similarly doing that. And they're doing that because they're seeing evidence that there are right. injuries from the vaccines. The vaccines can simultaneously have benefits and create risks. And for younger people, they're finally becoming aware, wait a minute, you know, it's not the cost benefit analysis is not such that we should be giving people these shots if they're under 50. Right. And for three years, you have not been able to have that conversation or, you know, attempt such a cost benefit analysis. Yeah. And as a result, people don't know anything. What I've noticed in all that, what I guess really shocked me is just how hegemonic mm -hmm. the mainstream press is on the mm -hmm. left. Mm -hmm. And I think that social media to some extent plays the role of laundering the power of the New York Times, the Washington Post, because, because social media is a place where stories are broken. It's a place where you can read primary documents. There is the, then the, the aura of autonomy and originality to social media that clouds the fact that most of what's coming through on social media is just your friends repeating what you heard on NPR that morning and mm -hmm. people are parroting this mainstream line. And then you think, well, no, this is like, this is my take that, you know, me and my friends came up with in our conversations online. It's like, no, you're just basically parroting the editorial line of the New York, New York times, the Washington post and NPR. But, but yeah, the, I mean, the, and I mean, no, yeah, things are, things have gotten really crazy with this guilt by association where, you you know i mean what my friends do along with the stuff you were saying of like being unaware is then they just immediately attack the messenger it's like you right. cannot you know what that was in the that was in the new york post well it's it's right. false right you know right. yes the new york post is a right wing rag and then you know you know whatever fill in the blank left wing critique of the new york post yes but it also runs facts and real stories you know, yeah. I always try and come back and be like, well, you know what? I also read the New York Times, despite the fact that they sold us this bogus Iraq war, you know, Judith mm -hmm. Miller, the weapons of mass destruction. I, I still haven't, as a result, completely thrown out the New York Times. Like, There's nothing in the New York Times that's, that would I would ever, you know, consider. It's like, no, I'm aware that they have an agenda, but also like, you know, I don't know where else you're going to get the news with these various sources. But the left cannot open itself to even real information if it comes from anything that has been deemed to be right wing. And on certain issues, that's the only place you're going to find critical information. This, I think, I'm going to ask you the question, does this have to do with means and ends? Um, for you, and you've said this, that, you know, your ends in politics include a world of free speech and civil liberties. Like that is one of your objectives all by itself. You, yes. So your utopia must include that right and i'm i'm fearful that this whole episode of the last six years with the left is showing us that much of the left is not 
committed to that is does not have that as one of their ends. They are, they don't want a society or they're less interested in a society of freedom of speech and civil liberties. Um, and so they're willing to do all kinds of stuff to achieve their end, which is, I guess, the removal of Republicans from public life and ushering in some sort of progressive utopia. Um, is that is that right? I mean, do you think? Well, certainly many on the left seem to not not care for civil liberties, even though, as I've argued in other pieces, it is really the left that has delivered most of these civil liberties, right? The First Amendment is only nationalized through struggle by the left. And the vast majority of the important cases that establish this right are pushed by the left. That's, you know, cases of anarchists and socialists and communists and trade unionists defending their right to speech and, and eventually going up the Supreme Court and, you know, winning. Mm -hmm. That's how it's, it's we, we have made these rights real. And the left seems to forget all that. Why has the left done that? Um, I, I think that yeah, I don't know really, but I, I think that there's a kind of a growing sense of dread about the future. And it has to do with climate change. It has to do with neoliberalism and the increasing inequality. It has to do with, you know, just the general sort of environmental crisis, plastic pollution, you know, the, the, the rise of failed states. You know, it just, wherever you look, the world over the last 40 years has become more and more dangerous seeming, right? And in reality, it is. I mean, things are falling apart in in many different ways, in many different places. That's not the only thing that's going on, though. Um, but that I think that, that that the left carries a kind of left left intellectuals, left middle class intellectuals carry enormous amounts of anxiety about all this stuff mm. and that it, like it, it's now cathecting on the things and like what we're seeing is a kind of panic mm. it doesn't seem like panic because they don't sound panicked but that's what it, that's what it strikes me as it's like we've got to do something you know the way that people who are you know trapped in a mine shaft will, like irrationally dig at like the walls what else are you going to do it's like you panic you're not necessarily thinking Clearly, it, so does that is. is that because they they genuinely believe that Trump is Hitler? Um, well, not all of them do, but but some do. I think think that he's you know yeah. a, a fascist. Not that he's Hitler, but that he could that he could leave the he could lead the country in in authoritarian direction. And yeah. I mean, clearly, the country is becoming more authoritarian. But I you know, uh, but not so much because of I would agree. <laughs> you, you, I think you and I would agree that that the center is as big a, a threat as the the left. You know, I mean, as as the right. You know, that the like, You know, we we've got a long record of this now. I mean, Bill Clinton massively expanded the war on drugs. Right. We've got to wake up to the fact that the liberal center is deeply authoritarian, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. is so. You know, I I'm surprised by the number of sort of left-wing elders who every four years their critique of the democratic party goes out the window and they're like this could be the last election and you know in our lives we've got to stop the republicans because they're proto-fascist and there are republicans who are proto-fascist but what they're but the you know left and the, and the center is blind to is the kind of authoritarian politics of the center. I mean, Augusto Del Noche, who's gotten, you know, was just translated in 2017 into English, but then during the COVID thing, you know, a number of people started reading him, reading Agamben, and then Del Noche, and Del Noche warned about this in the 60s. And you know, he says, like, we know about the totalitarian potential of the right, that's fascism and their obsession with race. And we know about the totalitarian potential of the left in the form of Stalinism and, and you know, justifying everything in terms of the class rule. But there's a third source of potential totalitarian rule that people seem to be blind to, and that's the, the totalitarianism of the center and scientism, right? Mm. And this is seemingly apolitical uh, justification for all the same stuff that the other authoritarian systems have ruled in. And I think that is the real threat we're facing now. It's this kind of unrecognizable to most people totalitarianism of the center, and scientism is 
the thing. The Nolce was completely right. And you see it in the rise of this fact checking. This is like garbage. The fa Somebody should write an essay on this. Read all these fact checks. What, what strikes me is so interesting about a lot of these fact check articles is how they're self contradictory, right? They'll, <laughs> they'll, you know, they're going to attack some claim. And the first thing they do is they misrepresent the claim. So then they're going to debunk this narrower or slightly wrong version of the original argument. And then in the process, they frequently will acknowledge that, yes, it is true that, um, you know, whatever, that there's been, you know, um, you know, whatever the claim is. But um, but that that whole, the idea that like this is, you could have some sort of non-ideological fact check, like this is just like taking the temperature, just like taking the temperature of a person. It's right. just like completely objective. Just give it to a scientist. Yeah. They'll figure it out. Yeah. They'll tell you what's true. Yeah. So um, Lenin famously asked what is to be done. And you have some recommendations in your article about the FBI and the, the weaponization committee, um, yeah. Jim Jordan's committee. So, you know, Repu MAGA Republicans, I should say, not establishment Republicans, but MAGA Republicans have been calling for quite a while to dismantle totally, which is amazing to hear coming from conservatives, yeah. right? Dismantle entirely the FBI and the other intelligence agencies. Yeah, I mean, I, um, that was, now, so far, you're about just, just about the only person on the left I've heard of who favors it. Maybe you and Glenn Greenwald are about it, but, you know, the left is not interested in this, right? In in dismantling the FBI, which, of course, every single thing I ever learned about the FBI and Cointel Pro and all the things comes from leftists. Yeah. Of yeah. course, 100%. Marxists, for the most part, right? Or the ones who've written about the FBI, the CIA, and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Um. So what do you want to do? I mean, what do you want the left to do? Well... I, I wanted the left to, to take seriously the opportunity of the S select subcommittee on the weaponization of the federal government, because this is the opportunity. Yeah, I don't think this chance comes along that often. And I and I I wasn't too specific, but the implication was that I would like to see the left pressure the Democrats on that committee to take it seriously. That that committee has subpoena power and the way it works, it's different for different committees, but on that committee, because it's a, it's ruled by judiciary, it's majority vote. Now, the Republicans on the committee outnumber the Democrats by three, but the Democrats could definitely probably get enough Republicans to join them to win some votes and open up investigation into, for mm. example, What's the FBI role in Black Lives Matter, right? Mm. What, what, what was going on there? We know what happened in Denver. Is that, are we really to believe that that's the only place they intervene? I, I don't think so, right? Right. The Democrats aren't going to do that. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, uh, what's her name? Um, curly hair, Florida, Hillary Was Wasserman Schultz. Wasserman Schultz, right? I mean, she's not going to do that. No. But if there was enough pressure, maybe... You know, that could happen. But what yesterday's hearing showed me is that that that's not going to happen. They're, mm -hmm. they're going to sabotage this. And so that's that's tragic. And I don't I don't think that um, there's much that there's much pressure from any left wing pressure groups. I don't think that the ACLU, I'm not sure, but I don't get the impression that the ACLU is like, you know, lobbying the Democrats. On judiciary, being like, hey, let's take this oh, seriously. You know, this, this this agencies, you know, they, they probably do need to be pruned a little bit. Um, I don't, I don't think the trade unions are pressuring no, no. Or, or any, you know, any other groups. I hadn't thought about the ACLU. Have they made a statement about any of this stuff? You know, I don't know if they have. I should. Good Lord, that. I, that's just unbelievable and outrageous. I mean, I think we would have known if they'd said something strong about it, but I don't think they. Have. Wow, that's incredible. A clear. Um, abridgment of the of the First Amendment, a uh, violation of the First Amendment. That seems like something the SLU should be interested in, but I guess not. Um, people are unaware. Let's talk a little bit about the history of the FBI, then I'll let you go. But you know, people are unaware. A lot of people know about Coental Pro's attacks on the Black Panthers and the Communist Party, et cetera, and various new left organizations in the 60s and 70s. They don't know at the same generally don't know that at the very same time from the early 60s to the early 70s. The FBI, through the Coental Pro program, was doing exactly the same stuff to the Ku Klux Klan and the American Nazi Party. Uh, not not as much though. It was in the mid '60s, mm -hmm. there is uh, a movement against the Klan. The FBI moves against the Klan. They have they open a Coental Pro operation against the Klan in '64 mm -hmm. because the Klan is 
off the hook, violent, attacking civil rights workers. And they're under a lot of pressure from politicians and from liberals in society to do something about it. So they do crack down in around 64, 65 on the the Klan. And it's never at the scale of what they did against the, the new left, which included you know, trade unions, the mm. United Electrical Workers, UE, um, AFSME. Mm. Um, so yeah, they, but the, those campaigns were not, they were not as big as the ones against the left. And as one of the scholars I quoted in the essay says that those campaigns, like the infiltration of the far right tended by the FBI tended to be more about controlling what they did, whereas the infiltration uh, by the FBI of the new left was about destroying the organization's capacities to operate. Mm -hmm. So they, they definitely, it was not, they were not even handed with the far right and the far left, but they did, they did investigate and they did have cases. Well, again. And then in the nineties, in the nineties, then, then it picks up huh. in earnest after Ruby Ridge, after oh, Waco yeah. the rise of the militia movement. Right. And then there's Timothy McVeigh's bombing. And so there's, you know, there's FBI, mm -hmm. uh, infiltration and and repression of those groups and you know, somebody asked me when i was discussing so well, what are you against uh, do police organizations not have the right to infiltrate and it's like no i I, mean, I think that <laughs> you know realistically no police have the right to you know put informants in organizations if they think they're threats i mean i like honestly like in modern world with crime and stuff like that and terrorism you know there's gonna have to be police powers but but what's not okay is to then start ginning up crimes right and entrapping people right and that's what the fbi has done lots and lots and lots of throughout its history and they just did it in michigan with my friend brandon caserta who was on my show who was one of the defendants in michigan who, who was acquitted but they completely oh, set uh, those guys up uh, on the jet uh the whitmer case the whitmer kidnapping case yeah yeah how yeah, I many they had over a dozen informants in there yeah brandon spent one and a half years in a jail not even a prison one and a half years in jail, and then he was fully acquitted um, yeah. for this. Yeah, complete setup, complete entrapment. Turns out, Christian, that the liberal center hates radicals of any kind. They hate anybody with a systemic radical critique of the liberal center. So that means that they have hated people on the far left, like our friends, socialists and communists and the Black Panthers, et cetera, and people on the right who have also had systemic critiques of the liberal center and radical critiques and wanted some sort of revolutionary action in fact right so they're they're very willing to go after they're very eager to go after anybody who threatens them in an existential way which is what i think that's what we're talking about we're talking about radical dissidents on the left and the right yeah and we're also talking about not particularly radical dissidents we're talking about um you know at least in terms of the censorship we're talking about uh, people like mild man mannered professors like jay Bhattacharya and martin kildor yeah, true yeah, right. like, who, who are merely questioning this gigantic raid on the, on the cookie jar by big pharma in the midst of this, you know, chaotic thing. I mean, like, let's, let's, let's talk about COVID first, right? Okay. We, we, we have this, uh, that's a whole, we, we talked about that last time, but I feel like there's more to say about it. I just, I read Andrew Huff's book, hmm. who is the vice president at Eco Health Alliance. Oh, God. And this guy is saying, he's like, that the reason there was this loophole that Anthony Fauci was sending funding to Wuhan, the Wuhan lab to fund gain of function that, that the whole, like, cause you think, why would that happen? That's insane. Why would they do that? He said, what he argues is that it was an intelligence agency effort to get inside the Chinese bioweapons scene. And so the hmm. best way to do that is to fund science, build connections, mm -hmm. you know, bring over us technology, CRISPR, this kind of stuff. It's, I mean, wow. it's totally insane. Wow. He's he's largely being ignored by the press, but you know maybe it'll come out in some of these hearings on this COVID stuff. But um, anyway, yeah, that's I mean, I forget where I was going with all that, but just that you know the the uh, the what then ensues from this, I think you know, inadvertent escape from what is clearly a you know uh, a concocted virus is concocted because. You know, it's they they found the bat virus that is the basis for COVID, and the only thing that's different is the spike protein on the outside, which by which the the virus enters, opens other cells, and, and gets into the cells. Right, that spike protein was modified 
so that it was more capable of entering human cells and mm -hmm. the experts have said it's impossible it is statistically impossible that that aspect of the virus could have naturally mutated and yet the rest of the virus is an exact clone of the original bat virus like that's statistically impossible you could have that bat virus mutate in a fashion that would cause its spike protein to change in this way but there would be other changes to other aspects of the DNA of the virus, right? It escapes inadvertently. We have a lot of evidence that Fauci and his crew are panicked. They're mm -hmm. flipping out. Mm -hmm. It's not planned. They're freaking out. And that's part of why they embrace this lockdown stuff. They don't know what to do, right? And then pharma gets in there and, they're, you know, I mean, the government is basically just throwing money at them. We'll pay for the research. We'll pay for the manufacturing. We'll force everyone to take it. We'll pay for advertising. We'll do we'll do everything except you just have to make these vaccines and then collect the profits and you know what have been the profits for Pfizer so I think it's up to 80 over 80 billion profits mm -hmm. right so these these intelligence services these rogue agencies have also been essential in just supporting that smash and grab operation mm -hmm. because it's like no one questions you know, whatever's going on, well, who cares? Like what's going on? No one questions, especially if it's like, whoa, maybe, maybe the, the intelligence community is partly responsible for this. And, you know, we need to um, not let that happen. So you need to shut down voices. You need to shut down all inquiry. Like you need to stoke fear. Mm -hmm. uh, as the, you know, we're seeing from the, the British documents coming out of how the people in, um, in Boris Johnson's cabinet, you know, speaking in very explicit terms about how we, we need to basically gin up fear. Right. Right. Well, none of this bothers me because the left, I know, will read your articles, um, learn the information that's been denied to them and see what is really going on and then join us in a campaign against the liberal center. Yep. That's for sure. Right. Isn't that the that plan? We can count on. Yes. That's the plan, right? We can yeah, count good. on reason prevailing. Good. Yeah, exactly. Good. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on again. And this is a lot of fun and uh, very enlightening. And I'm sure the audience will appreciate it, but keep doing it, man. Whatever, whatever happens to you. Keep going. Okay. Thanks thank a lot. Man. I appreciate okay, it. Man. Take care. All right. Talk soon. This is the unregistered podcast. And I'm Thaddeus Russell to become a patron of the show and have access to bonus episodes, AMAs, and the unreported news analysis show, go to patreon.com slash unregistered. Thanks for listening.